Hi everyone, and welcome to Shukin Science. In this video, we're going to go through and learn about some of the key structures of the brain, starting with the part that you probably think of when you imagine a brain, this big wrinkled part here known as the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum has all these folds and gyrifications that act to increase the surface area for impulse transmission. And you'll also notice that it can be divided into four different sections or lobes of the cerebrum. The first of which, shown in blue here, is known as the frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe is kind of what sets us apart from other species. And that's not to say that other species don't have a frontal lobe. It's just that when we compare the size of our frontal lobe um, to the rest of the structures in the brain, ours is considerably bigger than some of the other species, other than maybe cetaceans like dolphins and orca whales. So it makes sense that the frontal lobe is responsible for so many of the complex functions that make us unique such as problem solving, memory, language production, and of course, the ability to understand consequences. Maybe not so surprising, this is also one of the regions of the brain that finishes developing last. So some studies show that your frontal lobe doesn't truly finish developing until into your mid to late 20s, which maybe explains some of the not so great choices you made as teenagers or maybe helps to explain why toddlers, for example, are impossible to be reasoned with. That's because they don't quite have this area of the brain developed yet. Next, towards the top of the brain, we have a region known as the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is responsible for integrating information from all of the different senses and helping to make sense of it. We take in a lot of information from our surroundings at every moment of the day, and our parietal lobe, also known as the somatosensory cortex, basically helps to sort what all that information means so that we can make sense of it. Now this region here is kind of cut off by some of these internal structures that I've drawn in red. It's basically located right around the area where your ear would be or where your temples would be. And so it's actually an easy one to remember because it is known as the temporal lobe. So temporal sounds like temples right around your ears. And so it makes sense that the temporal lobe is responsible for bringing in information related to hearing. So all of our hearing, that information is processed in the temporal lobe. And then lastly, at the very back of the brain here, we have another region of the cerebrum known as the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is responsible for taking in information related to your sight. So when your eyes, which are up here, collect information from wavelengths of light, that information actually needs to be transmitted all the way to the back of the brain into the occipital lobe in order for your brain to actually interpret and make sense of that info. So those are the four lobes that make up the cerebrum. And then as we go deeper into the center of our brain, we can also identify a few other key structures that are responsible for, I would say, more basic functioning. So whereas these parts of the cerebrum act for more advanced functioning, such as problem solving, learning, and making sense of sensory information, the other structures control more things like breathing, heart rate, etc. So starting with this large piece of white matter known as the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a highly myelinated piece of tissue that just serves to connect the left and the right hemispheres of our brains. Now, it's a common misconception that men are left-brained and women are right-brained. That's simply not true. But what 
does tend to be true in a lot of the studies that have been done is that women tend to have a more highly developed corpus callosum, which means that there are just more connections between the left and right hemispheres of the brain, whereas men have maybe not quite so developed of a corpus callosum. So it's not that each sex is able to think with one side or the other, it's actually more that for most women, there seems to be more connection between both sides. So they're able to use both at once. Whereas for men, it seems to be either left or right, depending on the circumstance. So yes, corpus callosum, is really just connective tissue. Next, as we go further into the center of the brain, we have this structure here known as the thalamus. And the thalamus is just responsible for taking information that arrives through our spinal cord, processing that information, and then sending it out to the appropriate areas of the brain. We sometimes think of the thalamus as a relay station. It takes in information, figures out what to do with it, and then sends it off to be processed in other areas. And then directly below the thalamus, kind of in this diamond-shaped region here, we have a structure known as the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus has a lot of really important roles. One of the things that it does is it helps to regulate this structure down here known as the pituitary. However, the hypothalamus also plays other roles in maintaining homeostasis within our bodies, such as regulating our appetite, our thirst, as well as our internal body temperatures. And then, like I mentioned, it does sit right on top of this dangling little structure here known as the pituitary. But the pituitary is known for secreting a bunch of hormones and the hypothalamus sitting right on top of it does sometimes trigger the pituitary to secrete those hormones. So although often the pituitary is referred to as the master gland because it does make so many hormones, the thing that actually controls the pituitary is the hypothalamus. Located just below some of those structures is the pons and this long structure that it's embedded in known as the medulla oblongata or just medulla for short. These two structures are part of our hind brain. So you're not gonna find them in this wrinkly cerebrum part or even really deep in the core of our brain. You're gonna find them closer to where our spinal cord connects to the brain. And the job of the pons is to regulate our sleep-wake cycles. So the reason why you start feeling sleepy in the evening and you know to wake up at you know 5 a.m., that's when my body gets me up, is because of what's going on here in this structure. And the pons is kind of attached here to another really important structure known as the medulla. The medulla regulates some of our most primitive functions such as breathing and our heart rate. So basically the things that are most important to keep you alive, those come from the medulla. And then lastly, we have maybe the weirdest structure in the brain. Actually, if you take a cross take a look at a cross section, it kind of looks like its own little mini brain tucked at the very base of your skull. And this one is known as the cerebellum. Not to be confused with the cerebrum. I'm so sorry. I don't know why we like to name things to sound so similar in biology. Anyways, the cerebrum, which does actually look like a little mini brain, it is also responsible for some fairly primitive functions, namely coordinating balance. So the reason why I can stand upright and, you know, talk with my hands and do all these functions at the same time without falling over, that's my cerebrum, sorry, cerebellum. See, I, even I mix it up. And again, its main job is that balance and that coordination. 
So those are the main structures you could be asked to label in a diagram of the brain. There are many, many, many more structures here that we could go through and talk about. I am going to talk about two of them just because I think they're really interesting, but you'll never be asked to label them in a diagram because they don't have distinct shapes like some of these other structures. Same with the hypothalamus, right? The hypothalamus doesn't actually have like a membrane that surrounds it. It's just kind of this region here. Similarly, the hippocampus and amygdala are kind of tucked right into that central brain area around the same region of the thalamus. So the amygdala, right here, it's responsible for regulating our emotional responses, specifically anger. And the amygdala has really, really tight connections to the frontal lobe. That's why as you get older, you get a little bit better at regulating your emotions such as anger. Whereas a toddler who doesn't have a frontal lobe yet, maybe not so much. And then also very closely associated with the amygdala is another region known as the hippocampus. which is responsible for encoding our memories. So short and long-term memories, they take place here in the hippocampus. And again, it makes sense that it's so tightly connected with the amygdala, because if you try and remember, you know, memories from long ago, the things that probably stick out the most are memories that have some sort of strong emotion connected with them. And we think that the amygdala plays an important role in helping to encode those memories in this region. Okay, maybe two more, just because it's so interesting. Um, so there's another region of the brain kind of tucked more towards the frontal lobe called Broca's area. And this one is responsible for speech production. So the whole reason I'm able to talk now and what I'm saying hopefully makes sense is because this region of my frontal lobe has been activated or broke as area. And we are one of the only species with true language. Now, other species can communicate, of course, but broke as area is something that's unique to humans. And then there's one other really interesting region, kind of also tucked in here, more in the temporal lobe, but a little bit further down. So if we're imagining the cerebrum superimposed over top of here, we're going to find this structure known as Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area is similar to Broca's area in the in that it plays a role in language. However, instead of language production, it's responsible for language comprehension. So the reason why you're able to understand what I'm saying or understand uh, verbalized language is because this area is activated. And so weirdly enough, if you have damage to Broca's area, you can still understand what people are saying when they speak to you, but you just can't produce logical speech. You can't say anything in response. And there's a weird way to retrain your brain how to speak if you do have damage to Broca's area, because the region that's responsible for producing a song is actually in a completely different spot. So through really intensive therapies, people with area or with damage to their Broca's area can actually retrain their brain so that instead of speaking, they sing in response to language. And then they can basically take singing lessons to tone it down and sound a little bit more like speech. Damage to Wernicke's area, of course, would have totally different symptoms. If you have damage to this area, you actually can't understand what people are saying to you, even though you would be capable of producing speech. Um, less easy to retrain the brain compared to Broca's area. And so those are the structures of the brain, the ones that you will actually be asked to label, um, maybe on a test or a quiz, are the different lobes of the cerebrum, 
as well as some of these structures that are kind of embedded a little bit deeper in the brain. So you should be able to label the corpus callosum, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pons, the medulla, the cerebellum, and of course, the thalamus. Thanks everyone.